Hello everyone and welcome to the OM Genomics Show. I am Maria Nadestad. Today I wanted to look at some genomics file formats. In fact, we're going to cover five genomics file formats that everyone basically needs to know if you're going to do genomics. Um, so if you've been doing genomics for a while, hopefully you already know these, and otherwise hopefully you'll learn something. People will talk about all the kinds of different analyses that you need to know and things like that, but I think a lot of what we do every day really comes down to like the type of information that's stored in our very special files. Starting with the fast a file. So first of all, here I have each one and I've named them things that are like what they typically contain. So our fast A is the reference and I'm going to take a look at that first. So I'm going to use a program called less um, to take a look at what's inside of our fast A file here. So we have a chromosome name. The This little greater than symbol is basically like the core of the FASTA format, you'll have the name of a sequence that starts with that greater than symbol, and then you'll have as many lines as you want of any type of sequence. Uh, this is a really boring one because it's just got a lot of ends at the beginning, but that happens because of telomeres, right? So if I just go down a lot, then I'll usually find something that is not a telomere. Let's do another hack here and just grep for A and Let's see if I can find some lines that contain A's. Okay, here we go. So that's like what the sequence looks like. We just ended up with a lot of N's at the beginning because telomeres. So that's basically what a FASTA file looks like. Um, one thing you might end up wanting to... Another thing I should just briefly show you here is that you can grep for the greater than symbol. Do not grep for greater than without quotes and then put this because that's a great way to overwrite this file because the greater than in bash is how you write to a file. So don't do that. I've done it. I think probably most bioinformaticians have at some point in their careers done this. So I'm just going to do that. And uh, let's pipe this to less and hopefully this should show us, you know, I think it's just chromosome 20. Yep. But if you have many chromosomes, they will show up here. Most of you will see FASTA files as holding reference genomes. There are also going to be a lot of people who work on genome assembly, and those people will use FASTA files to hold intermediate formats too, like the context or scaffold, as they're building up to something that's more like a reference genome. But for most of you, you might only see FASTA files as the reference. So FASTA, useful for reference genomes especially, and for assemblies. And they just hold sequences, and that's it just sequences of DNA. It's a great format. It works. Now, let's take a look at the other files that we have. So we have a FASTQ file, which is the one I want to talk about next. So looking inside our FASTQ file, FASTQ files usually hold reads. These come from a sequencing machine. There's usually some primary processing that has been done on them first. Uh, we call there's anything before secondary analysis that's primary analysis, I would say. And this is like, it comes straight off the sequencing machine. It's going to be in some other format, but depending on what type of sequencing you're doing, like Illumina, Pack, Bio, Oxford, Nanopore, you might have completely different uh, formats at that stage. They then get processed usually into a fast Q file, and then you use the fast Q file as you're doing the analysis downstream. That's typically how it happens. Um, you can get other interesting file formats coming out of that and can use them like that, but most tools are going to want FASTQ files when they want sequencing reads. In your FASTQ file, you will have the name of a read, which starts with an at symbol, and the second line will always be the sequence. The third line is a plus, and I don't know if there's something that's supposed to come after this, but most FASTQ files I've seen do not have anything else on this line, just a plus, so I just ignore that. There's probably some other type of information that's supposed to go here, uh, but you can Google that. And the fourth line is base qualities. And so these, in this case, are like all Fs, but there's also some in here with some um, colons. They're usually like FRED scores, I think, and they can be in different scales. And that depends on how it was processed before this point, which usually depends on, on the primary analysis, right? So 
um, you don't usually have to work with these base qualities yourself that much, but downstream tools that you use will use them. For instance, if you're using these reads downstream for variant calling, you want to take reads as or take the basis of a read as better evidence if they have high quality scores and as less evidence if they have bad quality scores. I tend to use less dash capital S to view every type of file I look at basically and that will give you this so now you can more easily see you have like every four lines you have a new read. If you think back to the FASTA format that we just looked at, that one does not have base qualities. That's because they're not reads. They are some kind of finished sequence. So if you store your reads in a FASTA format, then you're losing base qualities and it doesn't become very useful. You can turn them back into a FASTQ format, but then you've lost the base qualities along the way. And so usually you want reads to be in FASTQ and you want your reference or assemblies to be in fast A and try to keep those separate. It's not usually a good idea to crisscross those file formats. On that, one thing I wanted to mention about less S is that you can set aliases and I've shown how to do this in a previous video, I believe, but you can add something to your bash profile or your bash RC. If you don't know what those are, Google them and then you can set an alias. And so I've set an alias that maps to L so that if I do this and just put L, that means the same as putting last dash S. And so yeah, look up how to do aliases in bash or C or bash profile. They'll show you how to do those. Um, I do this a lot. So for instance, when we were doing this up here, uh, catting the fast A and then we grab and then I always just like pipe to L and so that speeds me up just a little bit, right? Okay, the next one we want to look at is the BAM file. I'm doing this in a very particular order. Um, first you have your reads coming in a fast Q file. When, when you want to use those reads, the most common thing that we do with the reads is figure out where on the reference genome they best match. This is called mapping or alignment. Uh, you map them to the right place and you align them to see specifically, oh, do they look exactly like the reference? Or do they maybe have a small insertion deletion or some snips and so on along the way. And so the way that we store where the read maps and how well it matches where it is mapping, how it's aligning in that region, um, that's what we store in a BAM format. So let's look at our read alignment stop BAM. So these are called alignments. And if I just open them, it'll say it's a binary file and we want to look at it anyway, and this is what it looks like. Cool, super useful, right? So what you're going to need to have on your system, no matter what, if you're doing bioinformatics is SAM tools and you can do SAM tools view. Now I'm going to pipe this to our less dash S alias again, uh, just L because Otherwise, it's going to print a lot of things out on the command line really, really quickly. So I tend to do this so that I don't get just like a flood of output. So let's look at that. Okay, so this is what our BAM file looks like on the inside. Now, fun fact, when you're viewing a BAM file like this, you see what it looks like in SAM format. It's the same. So if you've heard of SAM files and BAM files, BAM is the compressed version of a SAM file. There's also CRAM, which I think of as like cramming more <laughs> information to a smaller uh, container. And yeah, CRAM format is kind of like a BAM. It's also a binary format, but it is simply more compressed than the BAM file. And it usually has some interesting things about remembering what the reference is. So it needs the reference to function in some ways that the BAM file doesn't. So like the CRAM file needs the reference in order to view the basis of the reads because it saves extra information by basically relying on the reference to save the reference information. And that way you have to save less of the bases that are in the reads, because if they match the reference, then you don't need to keep them. So it's basically something like that. At least I think so. 
I might do a future video going into more detail on BAM files, but let's just take a quick look here. The most important part is that now in addition to like the read name, you also have where the read is mapping. So you got your chromosome and your position, and you have a mapping quality which shows how uniquely the read mapped here specifically as opposed to other locations in the reference. And then you have this, which is called a cigar string. This one just means that you have 151 matches, or at least no insertions or deletions, you can still have SNP mutations in here, but you'd have to compare the read to the reference to make sure of that. Uh, and sometimes people mark the variants, but not always. And then you, you'll have additional information, you usually have the read sequence itself, and you usually also save that um, the base quality values from the original read. So this part here and the bases should match what's coming from the fast Q file, but you can have split alignments and things like that too. So you might be looking at subsets of the reads and it can get a little confusing. So if you're dealing with some of that and you want to look up the specifics and you generally want to do more like know more about these file formats than what I'm telling you, but I'm just telling you what they are so you can go look them up and so that you have a base on which to build as you start learning more. This is definitely not enough. It's just like all the stuff I definitely know off the top of my head um, that you know might be helpful to you. So cool. So this is our BAM file. Now that you have those reads and they've been mapped where they belong in the reference, one of the things that we might want to do from here is uh, call variants on them. So this is where we stack up some reads and we say, oh, do several of these have an A where the reference is a G? Oh, that might mean that we want to call a variant so that now we say, oh, my sample actually has an A at this position. Or maybe it has an A and a G because you have two copies of DNA from both you, from each of your parents and so on. So that's variant calling. You can look up variant calling. I'm not going to get into too many details on that, of course, because then this video would get very long. So let's look at what a VCF file looks like. VCFs are often gzipped. You might have to ungzip them or use tools that can read gzipped files in order to look inside them. But once you're in, they are just text files. You have a bunch of header lines that start with two of these pound signs or hashtags as we probably call them today. And you have several contigs, which are, you know, from your reference, right? So you can kind of see what your reference chromosome names looked like, and you can even see what assembly they came from, which is super useful information. So you have all this information up in the header, and what you're basically looking at most here, we have this nice column, which I wish SAM files had this more prominent. Um, you can look at the header of a SAM file, but it doesn't have one like this that actually shows you what the columns are. So to get that, you'll just have to look up the SAM format specification. And if you Google SAM format specification, you will find that for BAM files. So for VCFs, we have our position, uh, our chromosome and position. This is a single position, which is where the variant starts. And you have the, this is a little shifted over, but this is the ID. The reference is a C at this position and our alternate allele here is a T. And this has a quality score as well, and then some kind of filter, like did it pass or not, basically. And then there'll be additional information which you can encode, and these often get very, very long, as all the different variant callers want to encode different information in these positions. One you often want to look at, though, is the genotype. And so here, 0 slash 1 means a reference, and then the one it's one copy of the reference, one copy of the alternate allele. Um, where zero represents reference and one represents the first alternate allele. And you can have multi allelic variants here as well, where you'll see something here like comma, a different variant. Um, we might be able to, yeah, there's one, AA and AG. And so for this one, you might see a genotype that has like a one 
and a two. So that's both of the alternate alleles. Okay, I'm already getting too detailed on the BCF files. Um, the important thing to know here is that these are variant calls. There are summaries of several reads that were at this position and you're looking now at what is the conclusion, right? What does the evidence say of looking at all these reads and combining them? So that's what a VCF file is basically meant to do. And um, yeah, so you have your our flow so far. I wanted to show you what I often do in places like this is have a readme where I just copy down some basic code of how I generated these files so that if I ever lose track of this again in the future, I will be able to see how I made these. So, so this is just an example without any specifics in it. So you'd have your aligner, you provide some reads in a FASTQ file and a reference in a FASTA file and you get out a BAM file. This is very typical of a workflow. Then you take some kind of a variant caller, you give it the reads and you give it your reference again, because you still need to be able to see what the reference is to be able to call variants against it. You need to know what, what the reference has at each position. And from that, you get an output VCF file. So you can see you're gonna use the reference a lot, even though it's relatively constant, right? You have one human reference genome and most people have used that for a decade, even though you probably switched to your CH38 switch to tier CH38 and soon to the telomere to telomere, uh, whatever they're going to call their final reference genome, which is going to be so cool. I can't wait for that one. Yeah, that's great. Um, so this is like roughly what it looks like as you are. So this is roughly what it looks like as you're doing these kinds of analyses. Um, so you can see that the first four file formats we're looking at all fit neatly together into a very standard workflow. You can, of course, do lots of other things. Uh, once the reads are aligned, you can do many other analyses. Variant calling is just a common one and gave me a chance to show the VCF format, which I think is a very commonly used one. Um, the last format I wanted to show you is a bed file. This is really good, like I have here, for regions of interest. So let's look at the bed file. Bed files are really useful for storing any kind of list of genomic intervals, regions. Each region will have a chromosome, a start and an end. You can also usually give it a name. It'll have a strand like forward or reverse and a quality potentially. I think these are the main uh, fields, but you can look the specifics up online to learn more about bed files. They are super useful. They're very flexible. They're not just used for storing one kind of information. They can store any region which is like most of what we work with in genomics has to do with where is it on the reference genome? Is it in the same place on the reference genome as something else I'm interested in? You can intersect bed files and so on. So bed files are basically just tab separated files, but they have those dedicated columns which let you work with tools, especially bed tools, which is fantastic. And you can use bed tools to do genome arithmetic. For instance, you can take a bed file with some regions of interest and overlap them with a set of variants to see whether any variants are hitting the regions that you're interested in. So you can use BedTools Intersect for that, for instance. And BedTools is fantastic. Definitely Google it, look at their tutorials. It's all just super useful and a very useful tool. So hopefully this gave you a good introduction to these five core genomics file formats. Ooh, let me try to do an end screen. If you haven't already, subscribe to the channel. YouTube thinks you'll like this video, and this is a video that I think you'll like. Engage with the YouTube video in the way that you see that... <laughs>